Let's, uh, let's open with a, a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we are inherently mortal creatures. Creatures that know from the first moment our understanding is capable of it that there's an expiration date on each one of us. So we think about that time, Lord. But we've discovered in your word and in the promises of Christ and in the acts you have performed by raising him from the dead that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You've given us something that takes away our fears, that calms our hearts, that reassures us before you. And so we ask, Lord, that as we look into your word, you would give us ever deeper understanding, that you would hold us tightly in your arms, and that you would grant to us, O oh God, a faith and confidence in all that you have said that will endure and persevere through every affliction, every threat of the evil one, and every fear of what we do not yet see for our own futures. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're looking at this idea today and yet last week, uh, this idea of a soul, that you have an inherent part to you that is distinct from your body, that endures even when your body is in the ground and decomposed. There's a, there's a part to you that is not dependent on the body. It's designed to be part of the body. Disembodied souls are not fully what they ought to be. But there's a, uh, you, you've got to have this understanding in this sense that the soul endures after the body is gone. Now, we'll talk at the, by the end of this course about the resurrection of the body. So the final state of things is that you do have a body in the eternal kingdom of our, our Lord. But there's a time period between now and then where these bodies will wear out and you won't have a body. And I, I want you to know that there still is an essential part of you that endures through that, through that time. And I think I may have mentioned last week that part of the reason why it's important for you to see this is because there's a growing movement among pastors and some theologians to see human beings in such a, a holistic way that they, they won't dichotomize body and soul. Um, they, they see this idea of the soul as something that came, that crept into the church through the back door of Greek philosophy, right? It's, it's a platonic idea, the idea that there's this non-physical substance to you. Um, and somehow the church has adopted that, but the Bible shows that we're intended to be whole creatures. And so those are the folks that very often would say that when you die, there's a, there's a lot of avenues you could take, I guess, if you hold that idea. But the most common one is that when you die, then you're kind of, you're just asleep. There's nothing. And you're, you're, you're just at, you're just in the grave. There's nothing going on until the resurrection. So let's just say, for example, that Christ is going to come again. The last trumpet's going to blow a hundred years from now and you die tonight. For the next hundred years, nothing, there's nothing. And then a hundred years from now at the resurrection, you have, your, you have your new body, your new self, your holistic self. So you may not have heard that. Mo all of you probably grew up with the idea that we have a soul. I bet, I bet before this class started last week, most of you never even questioned that. It's just, that, that's been the common teaching of the church. But by the time your kids and grandkids are your age, more and more pastors will be teaching that in the churches. So that's why I think it's good to understand that we do have this, this um, dual part to our natures, body and soul. Intended to be together, but soul still enduring and existing when the body is, is gone. 
So the whole part of the reason we're getting at this is so that you do understand. For the hundred years, for, for this time period between now and when the resurrection occurs, we'll talk about what happens to you. And um, if you don't have this sense of the soul, none of that would make any would wouldn't connect, right? Okay, so let's let's look at some scriptures here that help us understand it a little better. Uh, maybe, maybe even before we get into the scriptures, just a few words. So I hate to throw out words at you, but if you're writing stuff down, it gives you something to write anyway. So uh, in the Old Testament, there's a couple words that you should be familiar with. Um, nephesh, which is most commonly translated in your English Bible as soul in the Old Testament. Um, now it's used of humans, it's used of animals, even God is referred to you know, as, as a soul. It's even used for different body parts. In other words, the words, all the words we're talking about have a broad range of connotations that can apply in the way that they're, they're used. But generally this idea of nefesh is translated and understood as a soul, or kind of the, the the life principle, the thing inside of you that makes you alive, whatever that, whatever that is. Um, in the Greek, which is the the language the New Testament was written in, the word for soul is psuche, where it's from where we get our English word. Anyone want to guess? Psyche, psyche. And so all the words with psyche in them, psychology, psychologist, psychiatrist, the, the etymology of that is this Greek word for souls, suke. Um, and then there's also, in both Hebrew and Greek, a word that's used for spirit. So in the Old Testament, that word is ruach. Um, I was kind of having fun with that because I was looking through instances in the Bible where Ruach is used. And there's a verse in the book of Job where Job is complaining. Um, and so Ruach, again, like Nefesh, has a broad range of connotations that, it can, that can apply. So it, it's usually translated as spirit, but angels are called by this, God. God's spirit is called by this. Um, it's also used like kind of the same thing for the life principle that animates you, that makes you alive. But it's also very commonly translated as breath or wind. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's like your wind. The thing that is alive, that you can't see. But that's your spirit, right? That's what gi that's what gives you life. When you have no more breath, your spirit has gone out of you. But the, the passage I was looking at in Job that kind of made me laugh was uh, Job's complaining about how bad things are for him, and he he says, you know, my my ruach is offensive to my wife. Is he saying like that his spirit is heavy to her or offensive to her, or is he saying he's got bad breath? Or, <laughs> my, my my breath is offensive to my wife. I don't, uh, it, so it's interesting how these words kind of kind of play out, and then also in the New Testament in the Greek language, the word that's most commonly translated spirit is pneuma with a p at the beginning, um, and so there again, just like psuche, we derive an, an English word from pneuma. Does anybody want to take a guess what that is? What is that? Pneumonia. Yeah. No. Anything with new with, with a P-N. Uh, U-E at the beginning. So like a pneumatic tool? What's a pneumatic tool? Works on air. Right, so the spirit, the breath, the wind is, uh, is how, that, how that operates. So these words have come down to us also in the, in the English. Um, so let's let's look at some of these. But what I want you to see here in the, the particular passages I've chosen tonight are that 
there's something about you, and whether you want to call it your soul or your spirit, I like to call it the soul, that's easier for me, but the, the, the essential essence of who you are, your basic identity, that it still exists even after your body is kaput. Okay? Let's look at, uh, let's start out with 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. All right, this is the story of Elijah staying with the uh, widow at Zarephath and the widow's uh, son died. So would someone read... Um, Verses 21 and 22. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. All right. And you see there where it says, uh, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again? Uh, if you have the same translation that I have up here, you see the little footnote next to that? Yeah, sure. Somebody look up that footnote. Soul. The soul, right, that's the word that's being used there. So that's nephesh. So Elijah's praying, let this child's soul come back into him again. And in fact, God answers the prayer, and when the child's soul comes back into him, when his life comes back to him, what, what happens to the child's body? It's, it's alive again. So when the child's body died, where was that soul? I, 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 don't, I don't want to say exactly. I'm not sure that I know exactly. But the, the point of the question is, the child's body was dead, but the soul still existed in order to be able to come back into the child. Does that make sense? You, you see how that how that is? Okay, let's take a look at Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, is there a volunteer who would read verse 10 for us? For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Okay, what is what is Sheol? Hell. What's that? Was it hell? I think we would probably translate it hell, yeah. Um, it, it, it was a place where dead people went. Sheol is the place of the dead. So, while, while the ones that don't believe in the soul and the, and the way I'm describing it here um, would, would want to translate that maybe as gray, that just the, the, the status of being dead, of being terminated. But look what the psalmist says here. You won't abandon my soul to Sheol. In other words, there's this idea that his soul in Sheol still has some kind of ongoing, enduring existence. And the promise of God is that that's not the way it's going to stay. Isn't that neat? Um, let's take a look at Psalm 30. And is there a volunteer who would read verse 3? Psalm 30, verse 3. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. All right, so there the Lord has brought his soul up from Sheol. Now, probably an analogy, right? The psalmist David isn't saying that he was dead and he was brought back to life again. But his state, his his the depression that he felt, the the weight that was on his shoulders, it was as if he was 
dead as if he was in Sheol and God brought him up from that. God, God restored him from that. But in order for the analogy to work, what does there have to be? There has to be a Sheol, a place of the dead. And there has to be a soul, right? Something that was there, after would be there after the body is dead. Right? Do you see that? Um, let's go to Psalm 49. Psalm 49, verse 15. Would someone read that one? But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. All right, look at that promise. There's the idea that his soul would end up in the place of the dead, Sheol. But God is going to ransom him. God's not going to leave him there. God's going to receive him. Um, so there again, in terms of the kind of the cosmology of this thing, there is this place of the dead, and the soul goes there, but the beautiful promise of the word of God, the hope and faith of the psalmist here, is that that's not his final destination. That's not the end. Um, let's go to Psalm... If you have questions or something as we're going through this, Jump in. I'm trying to read people's faces, and I'm not sure if I'm connecting or not. I don't know. Uh, let's go to Psalm 86. Would someone read in Psalm 86, verse 13? For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. All right, so are you starting to get the picture here about this? This thing, Sheol, this place of the dead, and the and the connection of the soul being there. Your body's not in Sheol; it's your soul that's that's in Sheol. Where's the body when you die? It's, in, it's still here. It's in the grave. So yeah, it's here, but there's nothing to it. It's, it's you don't when you trim your fingernails, you don't put them in a jar and save them, right? Because they're like part of your body. No, you. When you don't need them anymore, you get rid of them. And we always treat our bodies with dignity. Um, and we should because they were the houses of the soul. The soul took residence in them because we were created in the image of God. But we can't get carried away with that. There is a sense in which when the body is dead, it's, it's dead. Um, so when we do burials, for example, we treat the body with respect, right? Because it was the house of the soul. I still remember, because I, now I'm telling stories and I'll never finish this now. Here we go. But uh, when I was going to school at Quantico and it didn't make sense to move for one year to go to school. So Dawn and the kids stayed at Virginia Beach and I drove home on weekends to, to do my laundry and eat my wife's cooking and all of that good stuff. <laughs> So I'm driving from Virginia Beach up to Quantico, and I had to pass every week. Now I can't believe the name jumped out of my head. Oh, this happens to me when I get older. You forget the names of things. But there's a town there where when Stonewall Jackson, remember him? Remember when he was shot by one of his own guys, and his arm became infected, and he ended up dying? But before he died, they tried to save him by amputating the arm. Well, what did they do with the arm when they amputated it? Stonewall Jackson's arm. They, they buried it with pomp and circumstance. And you can still go and see the place where his arm is buried. I think you can still go there. Um, but why would you do that? Because we treat it with respect, right? Because the body carries a certain dignity to it. But what would you think of somebody that, like, had their loved one, um, what what is it? What do you call it when you put like a frog in the the jar? For, for, Formaldehyde. For, yeah. What's the name for that? Uh, preserve. preserve. Yeah. What if, what if they had their loved one preserved and put it on <laughs> like the over the fireplace or something like that, so they could see it all the time? Wouldn't that be creepy? Yeah. That'd be weird, right? Why? 
Because the body is dead. There's no soul inside anymore. Um, the, the body is now just returning to the <coughs> dust from which it came. Um, so it's the soul that goes to Sheol and has the promise of God that it's going to be rescued. What, one more here from the Psalms. Let's take a look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 8. I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. All right. So the, the point of this passage, clearly, is to show um, the omnipresence of God, that you can't escape from God, you can't get away from God. He's, he is everywhere, he sees everything. But in order to make this point, he's talking about this place, Sheol. And he says, if I make my bed there, um, meaning that there's, there, he, would, he would continue in existence. His identity still uh, endures if he should go there. In order to do that, you have to have some enduring part of you that still is you after you die. That's what, we, that's what I'm calling the soul here, right? Are you with me? Okay. That's right, a question. Some yes. of these verses said, you rescued me from Sheol. Well, if you're a believer, why would you, do they mean that they went to Sheol and then he brought them to heaven? Or why would they see Sheol anyways if they were believers? Yeah, good, okay, good question. So one of them, like, like the one I mentioned where David was using it as a, um, an analogy, um, so to say he, God brought him up from Sheol, he didn't die and go there, but that was analogous to how he felt and how God had helped him. So he was in the pits of depression. He was he was just so weighted down with burdens and troubles. It was like someone who was dead, and God delivered him from that. And the only way the analogy works is for the the cosmology and the anthropology to to be true. Um, but the idea in the Old Testament really was more so the idea that when you died, that's where you went. Um, and now I wish I could remember the psalm. I might have it later here. We'll have to look. I think I do. Um, the idea that when you die, you go to Sheol. And there's not a distinction between God's people and other people. Everybody kind of goes there. It's like the the place of the dead. Um, but over time, by the time of Jesus, the idea had started to change to recognize that when you die, righteous people actually go somewhere else and that from where wicked people go. So there might be one place of the dead, but it has different compartments or different areas, and the righteous and the wicked don't go to the same places there. So there's a there's a progression in the understanding of this, and that is okay. the The Bible really is what we would call progressive revelation. It's not like the progressive insurance company or the progressive <laughs> movement or anything. What we mean by that is that what God reveals is over time built upon so that more and more can be understood. He doesn't just give it to us all at once and we understand everything at the, right from the very beginning. It takes time to, for God to show people what the truth is about him and about who he is and what, he, what he's done. So it progresses over time. The culmination, the fullness of it all, is where on the timeline? Does anyone want to, want to take a shot at it? Birth of Christ. <laughs> Glorification is when we'll understand it, mm -hmm. I think. But the fullness of the revelation has already happened. Where, do, where is that? Life of Christ. In Christ, yeah. 
Christ has revealed the fullness of the of the Father. If you look upon Christ, you see the Father. Um, it, everything is revealed in Christ. But before before the time of Christ, think about it. When you think of the Old Testament, you had this idea that there's a Messiah coming, right? There's there's a deliverer that's going to come. Before that, you have to find out that we're sinful, that we need we need a deliverer because God is holy and God has given his law. So you can see as the Bible progresses, more and more truth is revealed. So it, this, the same is true with this idea of life after death. Early in the Bible, a lot of the passages seem to just be indicating this this shadowy place, Sheol, where everything is kind of quiet and, and dark and, and, and there's not much vitality there. But by the time of Jesus, we'll see more of this next week, there's a much clearer sense that the righteous and the wicked are in different places. And then by the end of the New Testament, then we have the full explanation of what what we right now would call heaven or the the eternal kingdom of, of Christ, where it's all going to end up at the at the very end. So it takes time to, to explain that. Does that does that get it? Yeah. The question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's look at uh, Ezekiel thirty seven. When's the last time I made you go to Ezekiel? I need to spend more time there. Ezekiel who? What chapter? Ezekiel 37. Yeah, do you know this? Should we sing, should we sing the song? <laughs> the bones, bones, bones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now it's going to be stuck in my head. Yeah. Did you know that came out of the Bible? <laughs> it wasn't just a song, right? Yeah. Um, so we won't read the whole chapter... But you, you, you kind of get the sense of it. Here's all these bones. They're very dry. Look at, uh, look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. Now, who, who sees the footnote there? Spirit. Ah, okay, right. So I will cause, as these, as these bones acquire breath and live again what's happening the spirit they're having they, they get spirit again right now they're just bones but i will cause breath or spirit to enter you and you shall live and i will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you so having the sinews and the the skin and all of that stuff, that's not what makes these bones alive. What is it that makes these bones alive? When the spirit or the breath <laughs> comes back into them again. Um, so look what he does. Verse 8, And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. So what were they at this point? Lifeless bodies what we are after we die, lifeless bodies. But then look what happens. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So you see what happens? The body without the spirit or without the soul is just a dead body. It's just, it's just like the dust. But when the breath or the spirit or the soul is in it, that's what makes it alive. Um, Pastor, was this kind of like a prophecy or was this actual? This is, well, it's a, it's a vision that he's had. It's a vision, okay. Yes. Yeah, God is giving um, uh, Ezekiel a, a, a vision. Okay. Um, let's go to... Uh, uh, I might skip those for the sake of time. Uh, yeah, uh, all right. So, so Sheol, 
this place of the dead in the Old Testament. Um, which eventually, by, by the way, by the time of Jesus, the Greek idea kind of starts merging with this. So what would the Greeks have called the place of the dead? In Greek understanding, where did you go when you died? Hades. You went to Hades, right. In fact, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, all the places where we just read Sheol, what do you suppose they put there? Hades, right. So this idea of Sheol or Hades, a place where your body is dead, but some part of you, something kind of goes there. What is it that goes there? They're, in the Old Testament, they're called Rephaim, which is translated a lot of times for us in English as shades. They're the shades that, that go there. Um, kind of like shadows of your former self. Not, not fully all the way uh, alive, but not dead. Um, it's, it's kind of, they're kind of lethargic. They kind of don't move very much. Um, and yet they're, they, they're there. They're, they have identity. They have substance. Let's go to the book of Job. Job chapter 3. Job 3, verses 11 through 13. Would someone, someone read that? Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb, and expire? I'm sorry. Through 13. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have been lain down and been quiet. I would have slept, then I would have been at rest. All right, so do you see what he's saying there? He's wishing, Job is so miserable, he wishes he would have died when he was born. And what would have happened to him if he had died when he was born? Would he have ceased to exist? Would he be extinct? No. No. But he would have been, he said, I would have slept, or I would have, would have been at rest. So there's this sense that the, the dead aren't really doing anything. Um, they're just laying there, not doing much. Go to, let's go to Psalm 88. Psalm 88, um, verses 10 through 12. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love in the foot declared in the grave? Or your faithfulness in Abdon? Are your wonders known in the darkness? Or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Okay, so do you see what he's saying there? Where people would praise and worship God, where people would remember what God has done, or be thinking about God, that's not what happens in the place of the dead. Everything is just kind of quiet there. It's kind of still. Um, not, not much happening. But there's also this sense in the Old Testament where they... they they're enduring. They still have some sort of conscious awareness of things or of themselves. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. Yes? Abaddon is another name for a place of the dead. Um, I, think it, I think it means... Uh, that might be the that might be the word that's translated in some places as pit. Don't take me. I, I'm not 100 percent sure of this. I've been, I'd have to go back and check it. But I think that's sometimes translated as the pit. So another place of death, a place down below, um, a place where where the demons come from. 
chapter? Isaiah 14, I'm sorry. Isaiah 14. And I'll, I'll read this. Let's start at verse 9. So this is... Um, <coughs> they're, they're taunting Babylon here. The, Babylon is one of Israel's enemies, a great empire which eventually destroyed Judah. Um, but there's a, there's a taunt going on here. Um, so pick up this against the king of Babylon. This is verse 9. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. Now what's he saying there? The king of Babylon is going to go to the place of the dead. He's going to go to Sheol. He's going to die. And what happens is Sheol is stirred up when he comes. Look, it rouses the shades to greet you. That's the, ref, the um, Rephaim, the, the shades, the people that are in Sheol. They're all going to get roused to come and greet the king of Babylon when he gets there, when he dies. All who were leaders of the earth that raises from their thrones, all who were kings of the nations, all of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, the sound of your harps. Maggots are laid as a bed beneath you and worms are your covers. So you see what he's saying there? The king of Babylon who thinks he's so great when he dies, he's going to go to Sheol and all the other dead kings and the dead rulers are going to look and go, you're nobody. You're just Now you're dead, just like us. You're, you're, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a taunt. It's a way of showing how he's going to be, be brought down. But for our purposes, what do I want you to notice then? What are the shades doing? The shades recognize another shade. They recognize the king of Babylon. The shades talk to him. So they're there's this sense in which everything is very lethargic there, very slow, very dark, perhaps very cold, but, but there's still this enduring sense of identity and um, people are awake. Um, I'm gonna run out of time, so let's look at, uh, let's look at, at least one more passage though. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28, 1 Samuel 28. I, I mentioned this last week, but I don't think we looked it up, did we? First Samuel 28, verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. What did we say necromancers are last week? Talk to the dead. People who talk to the dead. And I, I was going to be able to look it up. We won't for the sake of time. But um, you, we can go back and look at the Old Testament passages where that was prohibited. Um, Moses said, don't allow people who talk to the dead. It's forbidden. So Saul kicked them all out. But now, verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Why? Because the Philistines are stronger than him, right? Um, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor, so Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and the two men with him. They came to the woman by night, and he said, Divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring me to death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed his face to the ground and paid homage. Verse 15, Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? 
So where was Samuel all this time? He was dead. That's the first thing I read. But what does what the medium or the necromancer do? Somehow she calls him up. And they, she sees him. And they talk to him. So in order for somebody who's dead, to be, for you to be able to see him and to talk to him, there has to be some part of him that's still alive, right? That's what we would call the soul or the shade or the, the, the dimension to his being that didn't die. And, and interesting, Samuel says, why did you disturb me? So what was he doing down there in Sheol? I don't, I don't know, but he was at rest. He was, he was quiet and peaceful. And he does, he's not happy about getting called, called up here. But you've got to see that in order for the, the, the old, these Old Testament prohibitions against necromancy to be true, then there have to be dead people that you can talk to, you can still talk to them. Or, or there, there's no point in making this prohibition. Okay, I, I hate to end on that note, because that's, this is such a downer so far, and I did have something a little more positive to end on, but we're, we're, we're uh... oh rats, can you bear with me just two more minutes so we don't, I, I can't take you through all of this, but let's do at least one, just so we don't end on a real negative note. Let's go to Job chapter 19. Job 19. All right, so I've given you a sense of Sheol or Hades and what the Old Testament idea kind of was of death. Um, the idea that there, there was a, a, a soul that endured, but death was seen as this place you couldn't praise God there. Everything was quiet there. Everything was, was kind, of, kind of down. But even in the Old Testament, even before we get to the New Testament and before we get a fuller... Uh, or understanding of what happens after death, including the resurrection from the dead. Even in the Old Testament, there was still this understanding and knowledge that death was not the final thing. Take a look at uh, verse 25. I think I... Yeah, there we go. Yeah, verse 25. Job 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my, see it there? Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. So even way back then, there was this idea that when you were dead and your body was gone and your soul was in Sheol, that wasn't the end. There was still going to be a resurrection one day when the Lord would stand upon the earth and in our flesh, that means having human bodies, we would see him again. So it's prefigured there for us in the Old Testament. And the, the full explanation comes more again in the Old Testament. But we use this passage right here from Job even in funerals today. Has anyone ever heard this spoken at a funeral or at a graveside ceremony? Um, so it's, it's part of the promise that a disembodied spirit or just kind of a shade or a shadow or a ghost-like thing is, is not your permanent state. There's going to be a resurrection of the body. And uh, we'll, we'll see more about that in the next couple of weeks. All right, everybody, thank you for letting me go over. My apologies to choir. I hope I didn't uh, take any, uh, cut into your time too much. Um, shall we close with uh, the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, thanks so much for coming.